Hi, today we've got a new Soldier 9 to take a look at. This is the Miniware TS-1C. And effectively what this is, is a cordless version of the TS-80P. You'll notice we've got the same type of cartridges as the TS-80P, and it's fully interchangeable with those items. Uh, but the difference here is that the handpiece itself is completely untethered. So the idea is this has a supercapacitor inside of it, and every time you pop it into the cradle, there's a couple of electrical contacts which allow you to top up the charge in the supercapacitor, but while you're actually doing your soldering, you don't have a lead which is potentially getting in the way of your soldering. Now, it takes about seven minutes for the supercapacitor inside of here to fully charge from zero to 100%, but the idea is that as you're soldering, after several joints, you're always going to put the solder 9 back in the soldering cradle, and then you can top up the charge. Now, I think it gives you several minutes of continuous soldering. We'll try and work that out shortly. We do have a little graph on the display of how much charge is in that supercapacitor, but all of the control of the solder 9 itself is done through the base station because this has a Bluetooth connection between the handpiece and the base station. So if you want to heat it up or uh, change the temperature, you do that through here and that controls the handpiece itself. So PCBWay is your one-stop shop for all your project needs. As you know, they offer a wide range of PCB manufacturing capabilities, including very cheap prototype PCBs, production level boards all the way up to 60 layers and also rigid flex PCBs. They also offer PCB assembly services where you can get your entire PCB assembled with the components onto both sides of the PCB as well as CNC fabrication. So don't forget to visit PCBWay.com. So here it is alongside the TS-80P and as you can see it's quite a bit bigger. If we look at the measurements here it's about 140 millimeters long compared to 100 millimeters long for the TS-80P. Now it's obviously that size because we do need to fit that supercapacitor in there but it does actually feel very comfortable to hold. So even though it's quite a bit chunky here, it's been narrowed down in the area where you actually put your fingers and it's got this ergonomic design here. So it feels very, very comfortable to hold. And it's also quite lightweight, it only weighs 62 grams. Uh, that's because this is actually primarily made of plastic, uh, but it does feel very well constructed. Now, in terms of uh, the handpiece itself, obviously we've got the area at the bottom that we can insert a cartridge, and as, as I said, it's compatible with the cartridges for the TS-80P. So you just push it in there, and it's ready to go. We've got the two gold contacts here for charging the supercapacitor when it's in the cradle. There is a button here for boost functionality, so you hold this down, I think it temporarily raises the temperature. We've got an LED here to indicate the status, and if you do need to, you can remove this magnetic plate at the end and you can power it from a USB-C power delivery power bank and this will happily allow you to solder continuously uh, with that tethered wire. But the idea here is that intermittent soldering where you're not uh, sitting there soldering non-stop, you'll be able to put this back in the cradle every so often and it will top up the charge in the supercapacitor. And for many hobbyists or in certain situations, uh, this will probably give you effectively limitless soldering. When it comes to the cradle, this is a very nice design. At the top here, obviously, we've got the area for the handpiece to sit. So there's a couple of gold contacts in here that are sprung. And between soldering or when your soldering iron is hot, uh, you can place it in the cradle to keep it safe, but it also tops up the charge in the supercapacitor. Then in terms of user interface, we've got a 128 by 64 OLED, I think this is one of the ones that's split yellow and blue. We've got the familiar A and B buttons that we see on most miniware equipment, but in addition, we have a rotary encoder which allows you to change some of the settings a lot quicker. Then this is the side profile of the unit. At the back, we have a USB-C connector. Now it's important that uh, to know that you have to have a USB-C power delivery adapter or this unit just won't work. If you try and plug it into a normal USB port, it doesn't allow you to charge the supercapacitor or to operate the unit. On the bottom, we've got these areas here, and you'll notice it came with a sponge. And basically, there's three places that you can place this sponge. Uh, basically, it slots into here. You remove the screw, put it in, and then screw the sponge in. But you can place it in the side areas here. You just remove those and put the screw in there instead. So if you do want that sponge attached, you can have it permanently attached to the cradle to keep everything nice and tidy. And then also at the bottom here, 
Um, that disc that you can remove at the bottom of the handpiece if you want to use it with a cable, you can place this little disc here and it will hold it in place firmly so you don't lose it. So that works quite nicely. You'll notice the power rating. So this uh, requires a 45 watt power delivery adapter, so 20 volts is required. And it gives you about 30 watts of soldering performance into the cartridge. I think it's rated up to 36 watts, but these cartridges that you can get for the unit are rated for about 30 watts or so. Right, so here's what the unit looks like inside, and it's fairly straightforward. We've got a USB-C connector that goes off to this DC to DC converter here with these solid aluminium electrolytic capacitors. And then pretty much everything else is being controlled by the CH579 microcontroller. So this is an ARM Cortex M0 processor with a BLE 4.2 compliant radio inside it. And they've got the Bluetooth stack and everything on there. You can see the antenna coming off here, that little spiral of wire. And that's about it really. It goes off to that front panel PCB, but all that has on it is a couple of buttons and then just an interface off to the OLED. Uh, you can see it's one of those I2C OLEDs. There's the four um, wires going off to it. Uh, and then we've got a couple of wires going to the cradle. And it looks like basically the power to the supercapacitors is just being controlled directly by this DC to DC converter. And we've got some power monitoring here, a little current sense resistor, so the microcontroller can see how much power is being delivered into the supercapacitor. This is what the unit looks like inside. Obviously, the width of this unit is dominated by the supercapacitor here. And this is a CDA 3.8 volt 750 farad supercapacitor, so quite a large capacitor there, connected to the main rigid PCB with these two binding posts just here. Then we've got the two charging connectors that go off to the cradle. Uh, we've got some protection on this flexi PCB that connects directly to there. A DC to DC converter, and this is obviously designated to charging the supercapacitor. But underneath that on the main rigid board, you can see there's a huge inductor. So this is where the main boost converter is. So that this 3.8 volts or so from the supercap can be boosted up to um, maybe 20 volts or so for the soldering cartridge. Now, as you'll notice, this flexi PCB is actually sitting on these two screw terminals, which is a little bit scary considering this has a full ground plane between those two areas. Now, it is insulated with a, um, a covering on the PCB, but that looks a bit scary to me. If this rubs through, we're going to be shorting out the supercapacitor, so I'm tempted to add some Kapton tape or something onto the top of those two terminals so that we don't have any problems in the future. Um, but that's pretty much how it looks. We've got a USB-C connector at this end with an LED indicator and that has a little uh, flexi that goes off to the main rigid PCB. So it looks to be a hybrid flex rigid assembly. But overall the assembly is pretty good. Uh, I just want to do something about that because that's a little bit too scary in my opinion. There we go. So a piece of Kapton underneath the flexi and then a piece of Kapton tape over the top just to hold everything in place. That just makes me feel a little bit better because there is quite a lot of energy stored in this supercapacitor. So let's take a look at the user interface. I've just plugged the handpiece into the cradle. There's no cartridge in it at the moment, uh, but it presents you with two options once it's powered up properly. You can also see it's paired via Bluetooth. It's telling us there that there's no cartridge inserted and it's saying it's powered up and charging. And if we go to settings, we just press B here and we can go through the various things. So first of all, we've got the temperature of the cartridge and you can just scroll through there with the rotary encoder. I think we press B to accept it. Then we've got preheat temperature. So every time you put it back into the cradle, it drops the temperature a little bit. Now, because this is a lower power soldering iron, you don't really want to take this down too low because it will take a little bit of time to heat up. So uh, at the moment, the default setting is 250. Then you've got the sleep temperature, so after a certain period of time, it will drop down to 100 degrees C, or whatever you set it to. And the amount of time before it goes into that sleep mode, so 300 seconds there. Uh, idle time before it physically uh, switches the heating element off completely. And we've got our units, degrees C. Uh, we can change the step size, so when you were adjusting the temperature, you saw it went up in 5 degree steps, you can change this. Uh, to whatever suits you. If you want it really fine, you can set it down to one degree, but uh, five is normally a good... Oh, we're just between rotary encoder things there, as you saw. Uh, five degrees is just about fine. Uh, the backlight, so this is the brightness of the OLED here, 
I recommend you set this as low as you can get away with because these OLED displays do have a tendency to fade quite quickly. And then we've got the software details and then we're back to the main menu. So fairly straightforward and fairly self-explanatory and very quick to adjust everything. You just saw there, I had a little bit of trouble with the rotary encoder though. Um, it does have detents on it, but it didn't want to go uh, between those two settings so that I could set it back to five degree C steps. Right, so um, let's plug in a cartridge. We'll see how it works and we'll just quickly check the calibration and then we'll try and do a bit of soldering and see how it actually works in practice. So it's showing the power being put into the heating element. It is a little bit slow and also the update rate is a little bit slow here. You can see it's slowly creeping up. And we're at 330 degrees C. So we should be able to melt some solder on the tip here. Yeah, we are heated up. Uh, so let's see what the calibration is like. It's currently set to 330 degrees C as you can see. And pretty much spot on, as you can see. So that's really good. Let's take it up a little bit more. Let's take it up to 370 and see how it is. Or 375, that'll do. The rotary encoder is a little bit sensitive, though. It doesn't like to keep it setting that well. Um, There we go, the update rates uh, have improved, so I'm not sure that's probably to do with the Bluetooth connection, but the calibration, as you can see, is really spot on, and it does seem to give the real temperature measurement here. You can see it's wandering up and down. The set point, 375, but you can see this does vary a little bit. Uh, it's showing us the amount of power that's being put into the cartridge, so that does work quite well. Let's have a go at doing a little bit of soldering with it. No problem soldering there with the fine cartridge. And we've run out of power, as you can see. So for high thermal mass stuff, certainly this is going to drain the supercapacitor in here quite quickly. It's warning that we've got low power, uh, but it is still able to do some soldering now because it's melting the uh, solder on the soldering tip. Uh, let's see what happens because this is now blinking. And there we go. We get to a certain point and then it turns off the heating element to protect the supercapacitor. Then if we drop it back in the cradle... It should start trying to charge it back up. And there we go, so it started charging again. So after about 30 seconds in the cradle, you can use the soldering iron again, and it will start to heat up, but it will warn you that it has low power. What it recommends in the user manual is that you wait until you get two bars on the charging indicator before you start soldering again but as you can see it did allow you to do soldering it raised the temperature up to 340 obviously it's dropping back down to 250 now it's in the cradle uh, but as i said it takes about seven minutes to fully charge the unit after um, taking it right down to that low battery warning so as you can see the ts1c is a very capable soldering iron and it has 
pretty much identical performance to the TS80P. So if you already have this TS80P, it's certainly not an upgrade to use this station, um, but it will get you out of certain situations where you don't want to be tethered via a wire. And that might mean if you're doing some soldering in a car, for example, or somewhere portable where the wire is going to get in your way, then this is a great solution because it means you can just quickly do some soldering without um, being close to a power supply. Uh, but other than that, it's probably quite a niche market. If you uh, are starting out with electronics, then it's probably a decent option. Uh, and if you're doing infrequent soldering and that kind of thing, then certainly the limitations of the energy storage in that super cap isn't going to be uh, noticed that much by you. And also, one thing that's quite nice is it does mean that you do actually have a cradle because with the normal miniware stations, at most they have those little metal things with the piece of wire to hold it in place. This does actually mean you have a proper cradle for your soldering iron. And if you're just doing sort of occasional soldering, then this kind of situation where it's charging and then you discharge it and then you leave it back to charge again is going to work for you. But certainly for me, if I'm soldering up a large PCB, we're going to quickly reach the limits of how this system can work. Now one thing to note, this doesn't come with a power supply, it only comes with the USB-C cable, so you do need your own power supply and it does need to be a USB-C power delivery type power supply. I'm using an Anker branded one, I'll put a link in the description down below, but any one that is suitable for power delivery with an output power greater than 45 watts should do the job. Now many people have asked me if I'm going to review the JVC B iron which is a similar kind of concept. It's got a slightly more compact soldering iron. It takes the JVC C210 cartridges and it has a base station like this but then it has sort of a tablet screen attached to it and it has some of the user interface features that we saw on the JBC soldering assistant station, but slightly different. It shows you a graph of the temperature and the power being delivered into a solder joint. But I did actually use this at a trade fair. Unfortunately, I couldn't record at the time. But I was a bit disappointed with it, actually, because it's quite expensive. It's more expensive than the JBC compact station. But the performance was less than this miniware. And also the battery ran out a lot quicker and took longer to charge. So considering its price point, I just don't see what the market is for that JBC station. So I'm not going to bother um, doing a review or getting hold of that unit. This one comes in cheaper and lasts longer on its supercapacitor. So I think this one's probably a more suitable candidate if you are after that kind of cordless functionality. But uh, if you're interested in taking a look, I'll put some links in the description down below. If you've got any thoughts or comments or even some suggestions for Miniware on how they can improve this product with firmware or anything like that, then leave them in the comment section down below as well. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to visit our sponsor for this video, PCBWay. And until next time, thanks for watching.